Sister Claire Walsh was originally slated to present today's workshop. However, and this was a first, she was a, a first for not being able to be here. She was called to serve on a jury and was therefore not able to be with us today, but in a way that was extraordinarily uh, quick and generous, she arranged for her colleague, Father Ron Mercier, to provide this workshop for us today. So we didn't skip a beat, I'm pleased to say. Ronald A. Mercier, SJ, recently completed 10 years as the dean at Regis College, Toronto School of Theology at the University of Toronto. He has a BA in Slavic studies from Yale University, MAs from Columbia and Harvard universities in East European history and Russian history, respectively, and Master of Divinity and Doctor of Theology degrees in ethics from Regis College and the University of Toronto. As an associate professor of Christian ethics, Professor Mercier offers courses in foundational ethics, bioethics, and social ethics. Lately, he has focused on the relationship between spirituality and ethics. His new position is as executive director of the Jesuit Collaborative, an initiative of the Maryland, New England, and New York provinces of the Society of Jesus which seeks to integrate the spiritual ministries of the three provinces so as to better meet the spiritual needs of people in the area. Professor Mercier has served on the editorial committee of the Healthcare Ethics Guide of the Catholic Health Association of Canada. He is also active in bioethical consultation for organizations such as the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Catholic Health Association of Canada. He has served as consultant for hospitals and healthcare facilities in Nova Scotia, Ontario, Manitoba, and Alberta. In addition, he has been involved in spiritual direction and retreat direction in Canada, the US, and Ireland. Please welcome Father Ron Mercier. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, I always hate those introductions. It sort of sounds as if you've just died, but uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and to have the opportunity to, um, to help out uh, in taking, no one can take Sister Claire Walsh's place, but in stepping in for her as well. She's currently in deliberations in the trial, so she would certainly not have been able to be here. What I'd like to do today is the following. Uh, I plead guilty to being an ethicist. I admit to that. Um, and so the, the way I'm going to approach this is very much from my position as an ethicist. And ethicists love to use cases. So what I want to do today is use a part of a DVD about a group of Christians who make decisions um, in a very difficult time. They are a group of Huguenot Pro uh, Protestants in the center of France during World War II, a town called Le Chambon, who um, hid 5,000 Jews and brought them to safety at great risk to themselves. And I want you to just hear them talk about themselves. Um, I take it it will be shown on this screen, so if you can't see it, some of it is subtitled, so you might want, when it's on, you might want to gravitate over to watch. Um, after that, I want to just uh, explore somewhat the uh, whole question of how we go about, what is, how do we understand the difference between making a decision and discerning? Um, by that point, we'll probably take a little break. And then I want to get into St. Ignatius, not surprisingly as a Jesuit, and to ask how he begins to understand discernment. And I'd like to explore discernment not simply as something we do at particular times, gee, should I come to class or not, or something or other, um, but rather uh, as an aspect of our lives that's highlighted at certain points, but if it's highlighted, it's because it's part of the ordinary pattern of our lives. Then we'll come back to, all right, how does this work out? What do we do? <laughs> 
by the way, it's called Weapons of the Spirit, if you're looking for it. And the interviewer was born. He was a Jewish man born in Le Chambon of parents who were being hidden by some of these couples. So um, before we go on, because I want to play with this text, just or with this, this text, in a sense, with this uh, narrative for just a few minutes, is there any, are there any questions you would have or um, just to fill in some of the background? Or just a general reaction, for that matter. Yes. Well, that was interesting that there was there was seemed to be um, a large proportion of older people. Well, well, remember this is done in 1990, and they did they acted in 1940. So subtract 50 years from it. Okay, so they would have been probably 30, 35 years old, maybe. So this is done significantly after the event. Yes. Uh, I was surprised that there, when they were saying that they can really coordinate it from like this kind of organic path. I was kind of expecting kind of the story of you know, these leaders and they were coordinating something. And, you know, so I was, at least that's the way that they were describing it. Maybe, maybe that reflects some of their background. It does. And in some ways, uh, what I'd like to play with is exactly what you're talking about. What is it that can bring a community to act, not because they've planned it out, but that interesting word that Magda Torokmi uses, a phrase, she said, there was a general consensus. And she also says, oh, God, thank God we didn't have an organization. <laughs> it would have been completely uh, wasted. And I think she's dead right. Um, I'd like to play with that whole notion of how these people go about making a decision, what it says about the relation of decision and discernment, and then what Ignatius has to say about all of this. Of course, we have to have the obligatory picture of Ignatius. <laughs> a couple of initial things I want to say. I want to come back to Le Chambon in a minute. But when we're talking about discernment in an Ignatian sense, I, I want to make just a couple of points. First of all, discernment is not a tool you take out occasionally when it happens to be necessary. For Ignatius and the tradition, and the tradition that flows from him, it is a quality of life itself. You, one is discerning. One doesn't only discern. In fact, I think Ignatius would say, if you happen to pick out the tools to discern when you only need them, well, don't be surprised. They aren't going to work very well. Discernment is not exclusively spiritual. It's not sitting there waiting for a revelation from God. It's existential. It's what occurred in that sort of natural sense you were talking about at Le Chambon. It flows out of who we are. It's not just simply something we do. I picked deliberately people who are not Ignatians. Huguenots were, in fact, the people who opposed, by and large, the Jesuits in a strong way. The, the discernment tradition in the church goes back at least to the fifth century. John Cashin, one of the great um, uh, leaders of the monastic tradition was very strong in developing a notion of discernment. Ignatius makes it, in a sense, develops something which is very much part of Christian life. It is part of a whole sense of a life lived. And I want to make a step further. It is not a science, it is an art. And it aims at really seeing a life not as a product, but as a creation. And a creation which occurs in a community and in a special way in a community together with God. So that's what I want to explore. In a sense, you've got the nutshell of the thing. Discernment will necessarily include internal reflection, the context within which one reflects. You discern in a world. It includes one's relationships. It includes one's history. In a sense, it sends one in a drama, okay, which is important. That sense of, a whole sense of discernment as being not simply very nice and quiet and purely calculative. There's a dramatic quality. Who am I 
as I am part of God's drama of creating the world. Think of it in that way. Okay? It's very Balthazar, as it were. In this sense, though, there are some important questions that arise. Where am I set in the world? How am I positioned in my world, in my society? Questions that, in some ways, we take for granted. How am I related to power and its uses in the world? Very important Ignatian sense. To what memory am I heir? And if there's anything I want to really stress today, it is that discernment is historical. It takes very seriously that we are people who are not simply rooted in a moment, but who bring with us a history, but also a history with his a sense of commitments. And as I'll mention in a moment, it is also then open to the future. And if it isn't that sense of gathering from the past and creating a future, something really is lost. With whom do I identify? By the way, discernment is not individual. It cannot be individual. It is profoundly personal, but it is always set in relationship. And so if it's done in isolation, or simply in a way that is individual, something's really missing. And finally, what am I creating in my world, in my community, and so on? That sense of a future that's involved. All of those are critical questions. And they're at the heart of what it means to discern. Because they're at that rich part that we often take for granted, but that Ignatius invites us to consider. Well. And then, so what am I creating? In Le Chambon, well, there was no doubt about how they were related to their society. I'm going to move through this a little quickly. I didn't expect to see chapter 5 three times in the uh, text. They are clearly marginal, and they know that. And in fact, it becomes a way of understanding who they are for the sake of the gospel. Are they powerful or powerless? Curiously, in terms of the state, powerless. And in fact, they don't want to be part of the power of the state. But in terms of the power of the spirit, that notion of the weapons of the spirit, they would define themselves as profoundly powerful. Now, by the way, once I get going, I get going. So please stop me. Okay? <laughs> if you have questions, please, I'm happy to. And I'll pause occasionally. Critically, what is their memory? For them, and it's interesting, Pierre Sauvage picks it up very interestingly. For them, the situation they find themselves in in 1940, 41, 42, when, by the way, most of the world thought Hitler was going to win. This is before Stalingrad. Certainly the French thought, this is it. That notion of resistance, fidelity, in a place in which they were persecuted, recognizing power as a threat, but with a strong sense of scriptural roots. To go back earlier to the, to the question you were asking about a plan, in a sense, they had something different, a common memory. For them, they understood where they were placed in a sense that made them one. It gave them a sense of communal identification. With whom do they identify? Well, interestingly, of course, with the persecuted. Not surprising. Those who are like their ancestors. But notice the way in which that last woman talked about Marie Brot when she says, well, of course, these are the people of God. They are chosen like us. And so they struggle. And so for her, the ability to, and for all of them, the ability to see these people not as strangers, but as someone with whom they could identify made such a difference. In society, well, the state has its function, but their function was different. What does it mean for us to be witness? And finally, what are they creating? A space of safety that their ancestors would have needed, but a space in which the scriptures could be lived. So trochme is homily, which is we will not hate but we will not collaborate. That sense of a choosing a different sense of witness and to be, care, to be true to their conscience. <laughs>
It is that which gives them that strong foundation out of which everything else flows. Even if they don't advert to it directly, it's constantly coming out in the forms of what they're saying. Let me pause. Questions, concerns? I hope nothing's going to blow up. Okay. Okay. Now, it leads me then to talk about, remember for them, conscience was so important. It is for Ignatius as well. When he talks about reason and will, he's talking about that whole sense of conscience. For most of us, when we think about conscience, we think about it in a very reduced way. But for Ignatius and for the whole of the tradition, it's something richer if we pay attention. First, remember what they talked about. They, they, they talked about ethical reflection as natural, obvious, almost as if it were instinctive. It's deceptive because it tends to hide something that we've just been talking about. We're used to decision making. Oh, especially us in the modern age when we've got to plan everything out and by and large when we've got to be in control. That is, we know very well the ways in which we judge and measure various elements of our lives where we take risks and consequences and so on. And certainly the people at Le Chambon had to do that as well. You heard it in which in the space when they were talking about do we take teenagers? And obviously teenagers were uh, even back then, something of a concern. <laughs> they ate too much and they talked back. So there is a reset, there's a reflection of possibility and of limit. And they know that. I'm going to call that the level we're most aware of, decision making. But behind it lies a whole other level. And this is for an Ignatian really interesting. And that is their web of belonging. I'm not just going to talk about their memory, but it's that place in which they are in the world and all of those commitments and relationships that place them in that world. And it is something that is present to them. Ah, now a big Ignatian word, imaginatively. It's not something they necessarily think about, but it is rather as they imagine the world, it is how they understand it. It is the, the word, the prehension the pre-understanding they bring with them. It is that deep sense of who they are personally and communally that shapes their decision making. It is personal, very personal, but not individual. It links them to their history. It links them to their community. It is very much rooted and embodied, but it's also creative. That sense, which is in some ways just behind the background, so you can hear it in the echoes they pick when uh, um, uh, Marie Brot can say, well, of course, these are Ancien Testament, Old Testaments, they're Jews, but they're the people of God. It just comes very easy to her because she just knows that. It's the way in which she views the world. It's that shape of her imagination. When we talk about discernment, part of what we're talking about is that ability to bring forward that space of belonging, that place in which we understand and are placed in the world, those people with whom we are placed, and that purpose, that aim, or that end, as Ignatius would say, for which we are created. All of that is not necessarily something we reflect upon in this element, you know, but it is what shapes all of what we do. And at the base of it is that profound sense of what it is that moves our heart. So not only where we're situated, but it is, you know, so often you hear the passions. Well, for Ignatius, or a desire. For Ignatius, desire is not simply, it is natural, but it is not simply to be taken for granted. Our desires and our passions or our affect are patterned. They're shaped by the kinds of commitments we make and by the way in which we nourish our heart. Stephen Post, uh, the ethicist, talked about the way in which all ethical reflection is grounded in our ability to know compassion with God. 
And it's found in the way in which the spheres of our lives expand, in family, in friends, and so on. It can contract as well, one way or the other. Either one's heart becomes supple, as it were, that one has that deeper sense of understanding how it is to be in God's world, not simply in the world we take for granted, but the world that God seeks to create and invites us to labor with, um, or not. The heart can harden. And so for these people, remember, as they're in that community which has experienced such violence, they can feel compassion. And it's a compassion that creates a community where Protestant, independent, uh, Protestant, uh, independent Protestants, Huguenots, and Catholics, who, according to their, their leadership, should hate each other, share a conspiracy of goodness. Why? Because there's something there in which they shared a life. The two dimensions work together. That action that we have, which is rooted in a way in which not simply we do, but we create a world, and that sense of discernment, who I am, who we are, what I do and, and what do I or we desire shaped by our relationship, what are our hopes and fears, our relation with God, with whom do we identify, who will I become, who will we become. That deeper sense that's always in the background is so important. And by the way, I'll, I'll suggest most ad companies, and I don't want to make them demonic, but the best way to control someone is to provide a mode of discernment, which leads to action. What do, you know, ad companies don't particularly want to sell you a running shoe at $155 a pair. What they do want to do is sell you a lifestyle, give you a mode of identification. You can be like Michael Jordan that chance ever, in my case. But they play on the imagination to give you a sense that will direct action. Where Ignatius, really in that sense of discernment, invites us to take responsibility for our reflection. Invites us to be responsible for that imaginative way in which we understand ourselves and the world with God that leads us toward freedom. And the heart of Ignatian spirituality is freedom. The ability really to be creative, not simply driven. So we have two kinds of discernment. By the way, everyone discerns. We would say discernment is simply part there, is simply there. Part of it is customary. Most people simply take for granted. The best word for an ethicist is, oh, that can't be that way, because you know, it's just not realistic. All that means is it doesn't fit into the world the way I know it. It never asks the other question, is this the world we want to live in? Remember, 150 years ago, most of you would not be here. Women going to university, come on. It's certainly not realistic. You know what they're like. And yet someone, Cody and Stanton and the others, had the courage to say, why? Because, in fact, in that moment in which their heart and their knowledge spoke, it gave them the ability to be critical, to be open, to be creative. And in that space in which they begin to take responsibility for their imagination and their vision, something new could be born and hearts could be touched, perhaps in anger, who do you think you are, but also maybe in hope. What if that might be the case? And this is the art. What happens if one actually begins to develop and nourish that sense of one's imagination? What happens if one begins to nourish one's sense of what is possible in the world? What happens when one begins to nourish a heart so that one begins to feel things that might be uncomfortable, but that all too often are simply covered over? For the Chambonnet, oh, they knew the situation. They knew all of the factors, and they knew they were up there on the Massif Central, God, far away from Paris, you know, keep them far away from us. But they also knew the other. They could be moved powerfully by their imagination in a way that allowed them to ha have that conspiracy of goodness, not because they had an organization, but because there was something about who they were, personally and communally, 
that led them to a compassion and a creativity that said, at this point, I will take a Jew. Not asking, you know, what will happen in five years, and not unaware of the risk. You know, uh, Daniel, uh, Pastor Trokme's nephew was sent to a concentration camp. Um, but they were very much aware, un, understood in the response to the moment, the way in which they could say, this is who I am, and I must act this way to be faithful. Now let me pause. You've gone through a lot in whatever it is, about 50 minutes. Questions, concerns? Because I want to move to what is distinctly Ignatian after just a little bit of a break. Questions? Yes, Mary. Sometimes, of course, it's born out of fire. So, for example, the people of Le Champon inherit it. Um, one of, for Ignatius, and that's why I'll come to it, there are three sets of rules of really um, uh, think of discernment in uh, Ignatius. One of them is thinking with the church. It is the ability to discern the places in which I find those people who share what both moves my heart and creates my future. So it's really an intentional way, not simply a place, this is what I'm simply given, but a way in which I actually discern whether this is the place where God is calling me to be. So it's actually, there's a reciprocal relationship that takes place between what God is working in me and what I see God working in others. Okay? And that leads one into community. So for Ignatius, the movement of the exercises led him immediately to find companions. Now, through giving the exercises, but also to recognize those who might not have the exercises, but were discerning people. Who could also tell him that he was really way off base? So. I wonder if they would have, had, you know, would, I guess some people did act individually, but it seems like the community really gave them support. Oh, yeah. well, in some ways, they all, you know, walk in, you know, imagine today a pastor walking into a church in oh, St. Ignatius, okay? And I'm sure everyone would respond positively and saying, we have three illegal aliens who are about to be deported. You will, by the way, you, you won't be departed to, Bergen Belson, but you could go to jail with a felony on your record for hiding illegal aliens deliberately. Which of you will take, you know, maybe instead of saying three Old Testaments, I don't know, uh, three El Salvadors or something. Now for them, Old Testaments, we knew. And they respond. One old guy gets, says, oh, I'll take him to my form. But it's that it's that sense. And it's, it is one of those things where, that's why I said it's of a life, not just simply of a moment. Because if it's of a moment, then suddenly I'm trying to do everything at once. Very difficult. If it is of a life where one begins to really ask, who am I and who am I called to be by God? Then the moment comes as a moment of clarity, not only a moment of challenge. Oh, no. They were individually. And yet, they, they also knew their community. Mm -hmm. And they could say, you know, and, and so it became a thing of, all right, I don't have another bed tonight. <laughs> so, you know, maybe I'll sleep on the floor, as Marie Brat did, but, or maybe we'll do something else. That's right. Why don't we uh, take a break till about 1 o'clock? I know some of you have to leave at 10 minutes to 2, so we'll aim to finish there. So if we could say in about 10 minutes, we'll come back. This came up at break that I'd like to deal with, just, just briefly. The first was, um, do you have to have a faith tradition in order to be able to move into discernment? Well, th the tradition would say no, that there is the possibility of people of goodwill. And by the way, you can have a faith tradition and be equally just completely moved into one particular element. The critical thing I'd point to is this. And it is the ability to be in a space where one's constantly aware of a kind of tension. 
that gives rise to growth. So for example, the people in Le Chambon knew their tradition, but they also lived in France. They also lived in France of the interwar regime. So in many ways, it was the, um, the tension between being in one space and, not in, and yet not quite of it that keeps them alive and allows questions to arise. And that's exactly the opposite of a cult, which is something we'll come back to. But it's also the opposite of something that we take too much for granted, which is cultural faith. Most of us grew up in a space in which being American, being Christian, being capitalist, you know, yet fill in the blanks, anti-communist, go on. It was simply taken for granted. So that important questions never arose. Whenever you have that sense of the collapse of the horizon, imagination opens your horizon. Wherever it collapses, then imagination and discernment are in trouble. And with it, freedom. Because you simply learn to live with what's taken for granted even if it kills the spirit. Right? Now, that's on one side. The other side is the cult. The cult also doesn't want any form of alternative discussion, again, for a matter of control. How do you gauge real discernment? It is growth and freedom. It is the growth in the ability of a person to allow God to be created in oneself and through yourself in the world. So that sense of freedom, a cult desperately wants to control you. And cultural, and for that matter, you know, a cultural faith does the same thing by saying what God wants, you know, what, what's good for General Motors is good for America and must be of God, you know, or, which you know, we could have said not too long ago. So that's, freedom is key. For Ignatius, everything about the sermon is toward freedom for oneself and for one's community. And the people at Le Chambon are free. They're free to take uh, you know, the Jewish children, you know, especially if they're over 14, do you really want them or whatever else? Um, but they're also free to say yes. And that's what Christian freedom is. It's, the, it's not only that Augustine would say um, what's distinctive about grace, it is not only the posse picare, the ability to sin, it is the ability to do good as well. It's a real choice and decision-making because, in a sense, one's heart, one's imagination are so rich. Okay. Thanks for the questions. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to play with Ignatian spirituality. And I'm going to go through the rules for discernment in a few minutes, but I want you to think about how they fit into something that I've just been talking about, which is how do you keep the heart supple and how do you allow that imagination to be alive in a way that allows you to see different possibilities and different ways of acting in the world. For Ignatius, there is no such thing as a purely rationalist approach. You know, even though it's, he's often seen that way. Ignatius is of the whole person. Remember, when Ignatius says you pray, he says pay attention to how your body is placed. What helps you be in the presence of God? It's the whole person in relation to God, in relation to others. Today we'd say in relation to creation. And it's an intentional awareness of what's going on around one. And it's the development and patterning of one's desires of one's heart. So not simply taking desire for granted, but allowing them to grow, believing our hearts can grow more than we can imagine. Always dialogical, always imaginative, always as a way of life. In fact, Ignatius would say, if you're going to try to discern alone, except in a condition you know, where there's no one around, then there's something wrong. Discernment is best done dialogically as he says in his Rules for Discernment. Okay. And it's a way of life. And for Ignatius, discernment fits in to a whole pattern in which our lives are invited, in which we are invited to let ourselves be uncentered just a bit, to step outside the world that we take for granted and to begin to explore what is that world which is God's dream for us, that dream that Christ offers us as disciples, 
So for Ignatius, there are the four weeks. And I'm, loosely, I'm going to use these. The first week is that struggle that comes with having our lives disrupted, with realizing that the way in which, what we take for granted in the world, the normal, can be deadly to us and to others. Sin for Ignatius is not breaking some bloody rule. Who cares? It is that sense of a killing of freedom and of a closeness to God. And that first week is really about understanding what kills and struggling instead to come into that place where God can give life, the God who desires more for us, who in the cross is not judge but healer. But that's a purgative week. It's, it's that living in the tension and realizing, oh, I, there are whole things I've never even thought of before, and I want life. The second week is learning to walk around in that world that God wants to create in Christ as a disciple. It is, in a sense, illuminative. It helps us understand. It raises new questions. It invites us to make a choice to know and to love Christ and to follow. In the third week, it's inviting us to walk through the world of violence, not simply those who are heirs to it, but for those who are invited to ask, how shall I be with Christ in a world in need of healing? And then in that fourth week, what with God am I being invited to create? If God is risen from the dead, if the spirit of Christ fills the earth and in all its places, who, who, how am I invited to labor with Christ? How am I invited into this world of wonder and creativity? Who am I when I am set free? For Ignatius, it's a pattern, and it constantly replicates itself. Ignatius says the exercises do not end. Once you get into the exercises, they're a mode of living, not simply a task accomplished. You don't get to day 30 and go, thank God. <laughs> In fact, he says, once you've entered into that world where you understand that tension, and you understand that that tension brings not only struggle but freedom, then it becomes a way of grace. So discernment is that deeper question that arises out of that. Who am I and who shall we be with Christ? How am I invited to be not simply a follower, but a creator with Christ? Where do I find that freedom that can be freedom for others? How daily do I find God in the world and in my life so that with God, I can build on what is new and holy. Now, Ignatius gives us a whole bunch of rules for discernment. I'm going to go through them quickly. And I'm going to give you a general sense, okay? just a general overview. Rules for discernment are not rules for the spiritual exercises alone. They are rather moments in asking, what are the touchstones by which we understand how we're growing in a relationship with the Lord or how that relationship is dying? All of these are meant to be seen in that context. Am I coming alive? Am I growing in freedom? Am I deepening this relationship? So all of them should be seen, not simply, God forbid, these aren't morbid introspection. Ignatius is not big on morbid introspection. Uh, and certainly not navel-gazing. Ignatius invites us to a sense of wonder, of understanding what is happening. Is freedom growing? Is this relationship deepening? In fact, in some ways, as someone noted, these are actually pretty good rules for understanding whether I'm falling in love or not. <laughs> and that's what they are. Am I falling in love with God? Am I falling in love with Christ, with their world, with their people? This is not narrow self-examination. So Ignatius begins by inviting us in a very simple sense. OK, when you're starting off, how do you know? And he says, well, when you understand what could kill. So he uses the term mortal sin. I, what could kill you? When you have that kind of sense, then you can know that spirit. And he puts it in terms of spirit, the movements from inside of us. He would say, in such a sense, if 
you, um, uh, oh God, I needed a spell checker. Um, if in fact you're caught up in a sense of a world that, um, that is simply bound in death, then your imagination is simply going to be filled with everything that is normal to you. Nothing will break out of the ordinary. Everything will seem just simply normal. The power of the spirit is the one who probably comes across at first as a dissonant voice. When he uses the sting of conscience or remorse, and the word actually is an interesting one, it means the desire for something else. When that voice arises and says, I don't want to be here, then he says, listen to that. That's God. Where you hear the voice that invites you to want more in your life and a life that is simply settled for a normality that can kill, that's a voice that leads you to God. And he says, it carries on with that. For those who have decided to move into this, don't be surprised if as you begin to change your life, as you begin to move out of that which seems normal, don't be surprised if that path is a struggle one. The tradition calls it purgative. It's a, not in terms of purgatory, but in terms of a struggle. It is hard to leave behind what is normal. And in fact, as you do, they'll begin to say, oh, but didn't you really enjoy doing that? Do you really want to give up? Who knows? Chocolate cake forever? Or, as if that were what Christian life were all about, where the good spirit begins to give that sense of, you know, this could lead to peace. And for Ignatian, consolation is not feeling good. If there's one thing I want to say, please, consolation is not to feel good. Consolation is to feel with. It's different. I'll give you a distinction. Imagine being with your parent at the moment of his or her death and being able to be there in a way that cares for that person and being able to speak of your love to that person and to say goodbye. You don't feel good when your parent dies, but it's consoling to have been with them and it's an extraordinary gift to have been there at that moment. That's consolation. Desolation would have been, oh, no, no, everything's fine. I'm not going to pay you know, attention. Everything's good. And then you get to the end and you say, damn, I wish I had said what I needed to say. Consolation is not feeling good. Consolation is feeling with, being alive. It's a relationship that knows how to share one's struggles and one's gifts. And so Ignatius says, when you begin to feel with, when you have that sense of being with God and with others. That's where you're moving, and that's the sign of the Spirit. So consolation is being inflamed with love so that I can love creatures on the earth for the love of God. Consolation is then that whole sense of joy, of hope, of faith, of becoming more human. It's being with not only God, but actually being with yourself. You become more alive to what you would have taken for granted. Desolation, darkness, turmoil, inclination, restlessness, anxiety, lack of love, slothful, tepid, sad, separate. By the way, wonderful thing. By sloth, we usually think um, doesn't do much, lazy. It's not what sloth means here. Sloth in this case means, it could mean being too, doing too much. It is whatever prevents the spirit from being alive and doing what it needs to. So actually, and what I love is people who come on retreat and say, well, I can't really take time to pray because I've got too much to do. So maybe I'll take the first three days and finish off the paperwork. That's sloth. It's not being engaged in what matters. And maybe, and here Buddhism is exactly right, that one of the key sins for us is actually busyness of idiot. So notice the rules for discernment are really all about how do I allow this life to develop? How, do I, how am I with this person whom I want to love and with people whom I want to love? How do I explore myself in this, in this new space, knowing it's going to be a struggle because it's unusual? 
Ignatius then says, when you're feeling desolation, when you don't feel with God, wait. Wait, his assumption is God's going to be there for you. So wait upon God. Don't just sort of say, ah, oh, this is all nonsense. And he says, remember what you've known. Remember what you hold true. And in desolation, not to intensify our desire for God, to do those things that act against it. Whoops. Be mindful that at times we're left there in order to recognize our need for God and our desire for God. Once you're in the path of movement into that, move, into that sense, then you come to realize just how much you desire to be with God. And then Ignatius says, be patient. By the way, to be patient not only means to wait, it means to be willing to suffer. It comes from the word patior. And that means that you know, when one heart begins to feel, don't only feel good, at times it's the struggle that can be suffering. And Ignatius says there may be a whole variety of reasons why you feel desolate at the moment. It may be that you haven't really given yourself over to pray because you're not really used to it. It may be that it's a way of coming to understand yourself. It may be a way in which God tests us, he says. When in consolation, store it up. By the way, as a friend of mine said, who's married, he said, oh, what I've learned is in the moments that are difficult, it's important that I have remembered just why it is I love this person. It's a good rule. And Ignatius says the same thing about God. Don't let the moment blind you to what, has been coming, what is coming true over time. When you're in consolation, recall that you didn't create it, but it's something you desire. And then he's got the, I, um, I um, got rid of some of the horribly sexist language out of the text, so if you go back to read it. These are all from the exercises. The enemy is a weakling. And if you show yourself simply weak and alone, don't be surprised if the enemy becomes fierce. But also, don't be surprised if the enemy of human freedom wants you to feel isolated. By the way, this is classic for abuse. What do abusers want you to do? Be, be isolated. It's the same thing for a cult. What's the point of a cult? Be isolated. Ignatius says, whenever the movement in you moves to isolation, beware of it. It's not of God. God moves you to relationship with God and with others. And whenever someone says God moves you into a relationship that is, apt, that is isolated, Ooh, be careful. Even the hermits, when you take someone like Pacomius or Anthony of the Desert, they, were profoundly, they saw themselves as profoundly people of the church. So that Anthony of the Desert, the great hermit, comes back in to support Athanasius in his struggle with the Arians. And then, don't be surprised if the struggle reveals your weaknesses. The enemy is going to point them all out to you. You're going to reveal those places where, in some ways, you like the life you had. But Ignatius says, that's a sign that you're growing. It's a way in which you ask for help for God, from God, but also in which you recognize where you can turn to others also. So notice what Ignatius is talking about. It's all about repatterning our desire, exploring that space that at first is so unusual to us but always relationally, and never in that terrible way we used to learn in examination of conscience. Oh, you know, how miserable I am. Rather, the emphasis is on, look at what God is doing, always. And even in those places where we experience struggle or even failure, Ignatius says, the enemy is testing your defenses. Why? Because you're growing. Be attentive to that. So he really believes that God has created our human nature for freedom, for growth, for wonder, for all. And this is not just in great moments, but Ignatius wants it to be part of the regular pattern of our lives. So that's the first struggle in terms of, ooh, how do I get involved in this new, different way of living? Now there's a whole other sense how do I grow in love of Christ as I'm following him? And by the way, 
If you take the rules of discernment out of the context of a relationship, they make very little sense at all. These are meant to be part of that way of how do I grow in this relationship? Okay. And he says, what does God give you? And, and this is so odd because, of course, it used to be, you're feeling joyful, be careful. <laughs> that obviously, something's wrong. If you feel good, it must be bad. Um, in fact, that's not the tradition out of which Ignatius comes. Characteristic of, joy, of God is joy, which is the characteristic of the Christian. Um, Chesterton's right that the most sorrowful thing about Christianity today is that joy is such a rare occurrence. Ignatius says joy is the mark. Real joy, not pleasure. Joy is of the person. It's enduring, not just of the moment. Okay. The enemy hates it and would mad, rather make us feel anxious. And interestingly, by the way, Ignatius would say guilt is not of God. Contrition is. The desire to live differently. Not guilt, which makes us focus in on ourselves. In fact, Ignatius is not real big on guilt. And for we French Canadians who often uh, turned it into an art form, Ignatius would say, maybe guilt is something we should give up for Lent. <laughs> okay. And in fact, he says something else. He says, you know, there are moments when you are simply going to feel the presence of God, of being with God, and it's going to surprise you because usually it doesn't happen during prayer. You'll be out there you know, in some moment and you will just feel God's presence. He says, trust those. Those are moments that are truly of God. You didn't create them. And he says, consolation without previous cause. So you know, we haven't sat there and said, I am going to feel consoled. Um, but rather those moments that surprise us, that make us feel the real presence of God, he says, those really are to be trusted. Now, he says, there may be moments when you will feel God's presence, but in the context of prayer, you've been really preparing yourself for this. And he says, always test. And he says, the test is always the same. Where are you moving? The good spirit leads you to grow, into freedom, into love, into joy, into hope, into relationships, into reaching out, into compassion. The evil spirit, the other direction. So for Ignatius, that notion of um, fundamental option is clear. Where are you headed? Are you, are you becoming more alive or less? And he says, that's your test. Always. And he says, you know, be careful, because very often, the, he loves these words, the evil spirit. It's really the spirit of death. It's the Johannine sense. And Ignatius is very strong on... Uh, uh, Stanley's book on the uh, exercises through the Gospel of John points it out that um, in many ways that whole notion of um, that evil spirit uh, as being the one that leads to death, those elements in our world that lead us to death, often will come in through suggesting ways that are usually ways of excess. For Ignatius, everything is really by way of the human and recognizing that sense of where am I being invited, not simply how do I make this myself. And so Ignatius always says, when, you, when you're not sure, take a look at what happens. What's the beginning? It might have been a wonderful idea. Where's the middle and where did it lead you? For Ignatius, you may have been led into a real problem and so you may fail. And he says the failure is important because the failure helps you to understand what was in the beginning, what might have been a false heroism. So Ignatius had this extraordinary, when he was starting, uh, he was extraordinarily scrupulous. He was constantly looking at his own sins and he thought this was wonderful, this was of God. So he went to a confessor who told him he was basically nutty and to stop it. And he listened and he obeyed. But he, in fact, that initial sense, I need to pay attention to my sin, had really by the end become a perversion where in fact he was ready to kill himself because he counted for nothing. He had forgotten the love of God in the middle. And that's what was important. Ignatius says, learn even from your failures. Because even, now this is important for us, Ignatius would say, even there, God is present. It's not as if you fail, God takes a hike. But even there, the spirit will draw you onward to help you understand. So there's a constant way in which 
we're being invited into this, by the way, personally and communally in this way. And then when the evil, when you found out what's happening, well, learn from it. As Ignatius would say, it's profitable for you. Good. Rather than simply being concerned with where you failed, draw, be grateful that God has been with you in that moment. But then he says, you know, you can know what is of God. And he comes back. Notice how this keeps coming up. He says, in those moving toward God, the gentle spirit is delicate, gentle, delightful, like water on a sponge. It fills you. It just feels at home. Where he says, on the other one, it's like water on a rock. It's disruptive. It's noisy. It's violent. And for Ignatius, the spirit of violence is never the spirit of God. The spirit of violence is the spirit of evil. An important thing for Ignatius. And people of Le Chambon would have thought that at all, certainly. And Ignatius says, in those moments when you've had that just experience of being in love, enjoy it. But be careful to note something. You can move too quickly from being in love to then to the way in which you say, ah, I've got to do the following things. Ignatius would say, don't assume that just because you have fallen in love and had this powerful experience, that everything else that's going to follow from it is of God. Dwell in the moment and let it open up rather than trying to plan what's going to happen. Be in the relationship. Is this, in fact, where, God, where is God calling me in this? For Ignatius, God is as present to us as we can imagine. It, and rather, you know, like the people of Le Chambon, they didn't need to talk a lot about God because remember that, that first woman who simply says, those were the moments when quand on croyait, we believed. And that's all she had to say. Now notice all of these are relational. Discernment is never about simply looking in on yourself. If I, if I sound like a broken record, well, I intend to be. Because we overlook it far too often. And we think of discernment as either this abstract notion in this spiritual moonshine, or we think about it as just this warm, fuzzy interiority. Neither is true. It is all about relationships with God, with others, with creation, with ourselves. And the test of discernment is really a test of my life, of creativity, of response, of hope, of joy. And by the way, most often the people who can best help us discern are others. Because they'll very often look at us and say, what is going on? They will notice in us, but we cannot notice in ourselves. And Ignatius says, pay attention to them. He talks about spiritually wise people. He's dead right. Do it alone, and you'll do it badly. Let me pause. Think. Oh, and again, forget it. Ignatius would say, you are never an individual. You are never alone. You bear with you the whole of your history. You always stand in relation to God and to others and to creation. You are a person, which is to be in relationship. You are not an individual. And by the way, of course, scripturally, what was the worst punishment in the Old Testament? And by the way, I'll tell you, it was not death. It was to be sent into exile. It is the punishment of Cain. And he says, it's too hard for me to bear. And God actually then gives him a wife so that he won't be alone. But in fact, it was exile. And ironically, that's how we define ourselves too often. The ability to stand alone. Most cultures in the world would say, isn't that a rather poor existence? And all of discernment is about being together with God, with others, with creation, with ourselves. Let me pause. That's either a very good side or I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, there's a, a great book by Faroudi. Why can't I think of his name? 
uh, where he, he basically says, um, we've turned everything into a, a condition of requiring medication. Um, so that, in fact, what Ignatius would describe, now sometimes it is true, you know, and that's, you know, it's important to discern. But he said too often where we face things like anxiety, we turn it into a problem simply to be gotten rid of rather than in a moment which raises a question. That's right. So, so um, it becomes an important moment in which um, we need to ask why, as a culture as well. What is it about our culture that leads to such extraordinary anxiety? What is it about our culture that makes dis uh, commitment virtually impossible? You know, Ignatius would say, those, discernment is not just what you do for yourself. Ask about a culture which, um, which thrives on violence. Ignatius would say, if it's the evil spirit that leads to a sense that it's violent, what happens when that becomes normative for us? But you're right. Uh, you know, Ignatius would say, those are moments that are not simply um, pathological, those are moments which are potentially, in some cases, not in all cases, which are potentially revelatory. That maybe the spirit, the good spirit, like water on a rock saying, wake up. Right? You're right. Okay. Good. Now Ignatius also says it's a third set of rules. Although he doesn't call them rules for discernment, but that's what they are. And that's the rules for thinking with the church, which for many of us today are somewhat difficult. Um, but Ignatius would say the life of faith, and in fact a good human life, is always communal. So what you are always looking for are those relationships that help you develop that human and communal life of freedom, which is created. So you are constantly looking for authentic discipleship, which for him was tied very strongly to the community of the church, knowing who this Christ was and maintaining a strong sense of the link to Christ in scripture and in the tradition, the living faith of those who have gone before, with a basic preference. Ignatius says you always prefer the way of God to, the way, to your own way. Um, and so it's always seeking God, not simply turning it upon oneself. Uh, and it's often forgotten, but the ways for thinking of the rules for rules for thinking with the church are really a way of discerning how do I live in a community? What does it mean? For him, that community was the church. It's true, but you could use it changing appropriately in almost any community. Okay. Now I'm gonna oh God, I hold 15 minutes. Um, Ignatius would say discernment doesn't only occur in the process of um, your daily, you know, in the process of going through the exercises. Ignatius would say, however, that we need to school ourselves in deliberate moments of discernment. And those moments of discernment in a very real way should be part and parcel of our daily lives. They should be so built into it that in fact they prime the pump for us to notice what's going on within us and what's going on in God, with God. So Ignatius invites us into what is sometimes called the examen. Now I put it down here, but please do not confuse this with the examination of conscience. This is not a going through the day to find out where you've blown it nor a way to find out where you're deserving of credit. The focus is not on us. The focus is on God. And for Ignatius, it's important because for him, nothing was truer than that God was to be found everywhere. Okay? So that the spirit of God fills the earth in all of its dimensions so that we as Christians, or actually all people of faith, are invited to a sense of entering the world with wonder. I mean, most of us can barely remember how we get from bed to work in the morning. We just do it by habit. Ignatius asks us to be alive. Alive to the possibility that God will be present even in moments we define as trivial. Notice, we define, not God. And so for him, that quest to follow God in daily life invited him into a, something called the examen. 
And he said Jesuits could forget just about anything else other than daily mass and the breviary, except the exam. That that was the most important element of prayer, twice a day for 15 minutes. And it's interesting the way in which he invites it. First of all, thanksgiving. One enters into prayer with a, a deliberate sense of entering into the presence of one who has gifted us with life. One enters into the presence of one who loves us beyond our ability to imagine. Like Christ entering into the presence of the Father, you know, think of the high priestly prayer um, in uh, John's Gospel. You enter in with just a sense of thanks. But that also allows one to enter with a sense of hope because you're entering into the presence of one who doesn't judge you, but loves you, and who wants to find you. So for Ignatius, thanksgiving comes first, always. After that, there is a prayer for openness. The recognition that even after you've gone through these spiritual exercises, surprising as it may be, you may still find that you need some openness. And Ignatius prays that God will open our eyes and our hearts and our minds, our ears, in order to be present to where God is in our lives. So it's, it's a prayer for awakening, as it were. And by the way, you find that in so many religious traditions. And for Ignatius, that's key. How am I attentive to the way in which God is here? And then review the day to find God. Now, it's not, all right, 141. And what happened in 141? It really is an engagement of imagination. It's going through one's day for what stops you. What is it that maybe you overlooked at the moment that now calls you? Where were those moments of being with, or maybe those moments that now you realize could have been a moment of being with, but were passed by? Where were the moments that touched you? And it could be simply you were walking by someone in need on the street and it wasn't the moment just simply to throw a quarter, but something touched you. Something called you to compassion. What are those moments that made you feel alive or that offered you life, in a sense? Those are the places in which God, for Ignatius, is present. And he invites us to look at our day in expectation that God's going to be at work. And that the more one does, the likelihood is the more one will so that the next time one comes into a similar situation and experiences that, you have that feeling, this is God. For Ignatius, it was knowing, developing that sense of God's presence. And sometimes it will be the place in which you say, God, I've lived in such a way in the last 12 hours that I have been awake, I have been attentive to nothing. Unfortunately, for many of us today, it's simply true. And so Ignatius would say, it's the next movement may be one of contrition. Notice, not guilt. It's contrition. It is a recognition that I want more and have settled for less. And it is a plea to God that the future will be different from the present. So it's not a turning in on oneself as some you know, cosmic failure. It is that moment of a real plea from a heart that believes that God can change us. The flip side of that, of course, is hope. In those moments where we have encountered God, and it may be the painful God, the, the painful moment with God. For example, the one I mentioned earlier, where one's parent has died, and you are extraordinarily grateful for being there in that last moment, and yet extraordinarily aware of the one you've loved and lost. And that moment to hope also that that's not lost, but it's gathered in God. Examine is a daily way of coming alive. And for Ignatius, it is a classic point of discernment because it may make you aware of certain things that touch you. And you begin to say, why am I so interested in, who knows, ethics, um, whatever else, that it becomes a way in which you begin to say, gee, I feel alive when I'm in ethics class, unlike in, and I won't fill in the blank. Okay? Examine is very much a mode of discernment. Now, Ignatius also says, well, you know, if you're discerning, 
Sometimes you will have to make some major decisions in your life. And it may be like Le Chambon, do I risk my future on accepting Jews or illegal aliens into my home? And Ignatius says, if you've lived a life of discernment, then there are three possible ways in which you're going to approach that. And he says, each one of them has a value. But notice he says, you don't just pull this toolbox out and say, gee, OK, now I've got to make this decision, so I'm going to discern. He says, you know, it's rather like being attuned with art, but to music. If you've learned how to listen to music, it becomes easier and easier, and you discover little subtleties you've never heard before. If you've never listened to music and suddenly you hear an atonal piece, you begin to think, oh, God, my, you know, my uh, MP3 player is broken or whatever else. But for Ignatius, there can be the moment of election. And the more important it is, the more you trust, you turn to God for some kind of sense. You know, for example, do I marry? Do I uh, accept a certain form of ministry? Whatever else. For Ignatius, the first thing is, and it, notice it's what we've been doing right through. It's what was there in Chambon, in Le Chambon. My first aim has to be to seek to serve God, who is my end. Now, that sounds so cold. For Ignatius, it's not. It means what I desire more than anything else. The shape of my life. It, Arupe had this wonderful, Pedro Arupe was general of the Jesuits, was asked, who is Jesus for you? And he looked at the, uh, the interviewer and said, who is Jesus? He's everything. Ignatius would have liked that. Because that's what he means by the end of my life. And also, then, once I've decided... What I want is to grow in my relationship with God. Then the question is, how does whatever it is fit into that? Okay. And Ignatius says, if you're dealing with permanent elections, be real careful. And he says there are three kinds, what he calls times or modes of election. The first, the thunderbolt, where you just have a sense from God that you know that cuts you to the core that you say, this is it. I respond. Um, so it's been follow, you follow what's been so manifest. It's just clear. It's that moment when you've fallen in love with God through whatever. The call of Saul, the call of Matthew, the call of Mother Teresa. She's standing, standing on the uh, prow of a boat going from Ireland to India. She just knew. It was for the poor. And Ignatius says it is so clear that at that point, you become alive and God becomes alive and the future has a clarity to it. And the issue at that point is simply, do I say yes or no? But at that point, the no doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense because you've become alive and you know this is what it means. But Ignatius says, there's another point. There's another part. God doesn't only work by the thunderbolt. And by the way, that's part of the illusion. I remember directing the exercises and it's always one of those things. I remember someone coming in and saying, and so I said, well, how's your prayer? And the person said, well, there's nothing happening. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I pray, and yeah, I'm getting to know Jesus, and I really like him. And I'm getting to know more about him, and I'm really, I'd like to come to pray. And, you know, I really find that I'm praying during the day, and, but there's nothing happening. <laughs> and you go, okay. Um, and then you realize what the person thinks by something happening is the first moment. There's no thunderbolt. Well, that's not the only way God acts. For Ignatius says, Ignatius, often more typical is this. I begin to ask what's going on in my heart. What's bringing me alive? What's moving me away from God? What, so I begin actually to listen to my heart in an important way over time. Second moment takes time. I listen. As I imagine myself, um, whatever, getting married to a particular person, what's going on in my heart? Do I find myself deepening in consolation that God is really here or not? And so for Ignatius, that second moment is really paying attention. If your hearts come alive, then God will speak through it. So that second moment, Ignatius would say, probably is a typical one. It, but it's an application of ordinary discernment. So what's been happening in the examen for Ignatius, you know, that way of finding God throughout the life, 
now becomes the moment that's actually there when you make the that, that moment of, he would say, election or choice because your heart has that sense of being present to God. And then he says, but in all of this, the issue isn't to force. For Ignatius, forcing prayer is like trying to force love. The only thing you're going to do is drive yourself and the other person crazy. Instead, be like an equilibrium. Wait. Be patient. Listen to your heart. Wait upon God. Let things grow. And for most of us today, that is horrible. You know, when you think of the way in which most of us Catholics celebrate Eucharist, it's on the stopwatch. We're not even patient in church. A five-second silence is too much. Uh, his father fallen asleep? You know, is something wrong up there? <laughs> Ignatius would say, we are like an equilibrium. Be attentive, like a balance, so that God can move us. And that requires patience, since this is part of a relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, with creation, with the community we love. All of this. That takes time but always for the greater glory and praise of our God. And for the salvation of my soul, we would add, for the care of all people and all of creation. It's to, the aim is to experience what draws me to God, places me within a pos position of consolation and peace, what becomes natural to me before God. This is often what's usually thought of as discernment, that second time. But it's notice it fits into a whole pattern. And it involves reasoned reflection. Ignatius is not irrational. An imaginative grasp of my life with God in Christ and an awareness of my own inner life in relation to God who loves me and whom I love. Okay. And it's being attuned. And in many ways, it is Le Chambon's pattern of discernment. Now the third one, and I realize I have to be quick, some of you have to leave and it's my apology. Um, the third one is nothing's moving. Ignatius says, trust that God isn't going to abandon you. And he says, don't be agitated. Use the gifts God's given you and that's your reason and your imagination. And he gives you two patterns. The first And it just moves you through steps. What am I considering? What is my ultimate goal? I ask God to enlighten me. Again, it's, you know, notice it's just like the examen. And then, you know, this if some, sometimes you've seen this, it's the chart. What are the pluses and the minuses? And then you just weigh them up. Is it more going to lead me to life or more away from it? Is it dangerous or, you know, are there more dangers to my relationship with God or more graces? And then he says, Can keep this in light, reason, and bring it in prayer before God. So you actually go through a, you know, a kind of balance sheet, as it were. Is this good or not? Um, and Ignatius would say, you trust that if you've been looking for God, God's not going to abandon you. Now, the second one, and Ignatius says, hmm, let me give you another way. Notice how he uses imagination. Imagine you are talking to someone you've never met before, but a good person who is seeking God, which is always key for Ignatius. Don't bother discerning if that's not the case. And he would say, if you were talking to that person, what would you advise him or her in this situation? And that's actually pretty good advice, because often we give much better advice to others than we would ever do to ourselves. What would you say to them? Engage your imagination. And maybe you actually do it by talking to somebody in that process. Or imagine you're at the moment of death and you have to make this choice. Now, if it's a choice of getting married or not, it's not particularly helpful. But um, what would you choose if you were at the moment of death? Or if you were standing before God on judgment day, and you had to present this decision before God, would you feel at peace and joy or not? So it's consistent for Ignatius. You use all of your gift, whether it's imagination or in the previous one, 
the reasoning gifts God has given us, you use them in a way that allows you to grow closer to God. In sum, the sermon is part of a broader path of loving and seeking God, of growing, of learning to live in God's world, and of reshaping my world, of patterning my desires and our desires and affect toward the love of God and toward freedom. I should have asked, added that. It is always in a series of relationships that gives rise to wisdom. And it really invites us to delight in the people, the wisdom figures in our lives. It is creative. If, you think, if anyone thinks of discernment as deadening, they've missed the point. If anything, when you discern, the world becomes more fully alive. And finally, it's a life of freedom and it's a, life, a way of life and of freedom that shapes our choices because it shapes us who make our choices with God. And on that note, thank you. <laughs>